I'm a senior customer success manager with Bright Flag. I've been with the company now for almost five years. And my role within the organization is to, to work with customers and in particular future focused work with customers to ensure that they're getting insights from the data that we analyze. Um, so ensuring that they get value and that they, for you know, a good example, ensure that they're you know, applying the data that they get from Bright Flag to help manage those relationships with law firms in, a, in an effective and efficient manner. Um, before I joined Bright Flag, I worked as a corporate lawyer in a firm in Dublin called Matheson. So I used to be a litigator before this. And um, so I have quite a bit of an experience in terms of the law firm side and also a very good insight into legal teams and how they manage um, outside counsel. Um, I'll hand over to Jonathan uh, to just give an introduction as well. Sure. Thank you. Um, and thank you again for having me. This is exciting and a topic that I think you'll see is near and dear to my heart. Um, <laughs> I've been at um, Empire State Realty Trust for um, coming up on five years now, uh, five really great years. Um, prior to that, I was also a litigator. I worked at um, a boutique firm that um, that spun off of a larger firm, uh, and I was doing litigation there for about seven and a half years on behalf of Empire State Realty Trust and its predecessors. So that's how I, I made the way over. Um, and going in-house has sort of helped me sort of evolve my career in some ways to become more of a you know corporate generalist get involved in a lot of different areas rather than just litigation which informed a lot of my thinking about what we're going to talk about brilliant i'm very excited to to delve into all of that experience um so just to to set the scene for everybody we've decided to you know today's topic is focused on the relationship with outside counsel and it's certainly where we'll spend a lot of time but we do need to, to look at some internal aspects for the legal team first. So we've broken the, the talk out into four different uh, pillars, so to speak. The first part will be talking to how one gets one's house in order. So how you get the legal team house in order um, and Jonathan's experience in this regard will be you know, really insightful, I think, for everybody to hear. We'll then move on to how you refine processes and clear paths for the legal team ideally to tee up that efficient and effective relationship with your outside counsel. The third part will be uh, a discussion around how you set expectations and how you handle exceptions. And that's both within the legal team and also with your outside counsel. And then the final piece will be around how you evaluate performance on the part of the law firm without bias. Um, so they're the broad themes that we're going to step through. Um, so what we will do is focus in on the first one, so getting your in-house in order. Um, and we'll start with the kind of internal view at a at a 30,000 foot perspective. So we're going to look at that kind of helicopter view. And Jonathan, I know the way you phrased it before, uh, which I think is a really good way to phrase it, is what do we want to be or who do we want to be when we grow up as a legal team? So we'll certainly be tapping into that and how you've kind of approached that over the last five years in Empress State really really that you trust. Just in terms of audience participation, as we're going through each theme and as we're discussing Jonathan's experience here, it would be useful and, and interesting to, if you want to pop into the chat, any models or, you know, kind of any of your own experiences that you've had, or maybe uh, what, what do you wish your answer would be in terms of your legal team and what you would like to evolve to. Um, we'll keep an eye on the chat and obviously as Colin said as well we'll leave questions at the end and um, so we certainly will have time to, to address your, your questions and have a discussion at the end. So Jonathan, um, in terms of that question of who do we want to be when we grow up, um, like I know that you mentioned so you've been with ESRT for five years before that you worked for them so you obviously had a very good understanding of that legal team and um, when you were asking yourself that question like how I guess how did you what was the approach that you you took towards it and how did you kind of determine well what is working and what's not working and uh, when you started in your new role so it started with sort of my evolution on a personal level which is you know what did i want to be right i came in as a litigator and <laughs> the reason why i went in house to a pretty lean really effective legal team was to become more of a generalist to start learning different areas and touching different areas you know, to become more of a multi-dimensional player, so to speak. Um, and in the meantime, also, you know, one of the big advantages to being in-house that no matter how good an outside lawyer is, they just can't get to just because of, you know, the distance is you can really embed yourself in the team. 
You know, not just say, hey, here's a task that the business people need me to get done. It's what's the business strategy here? How do these people think? Where do they think they're going to be in six, nine, 12 months? And how does my role complement that? So I can almost think without them having to ask me, anticipate, hey, they're going here. And I think that could bring up A, B, and C risk, or that could present X, Y, Z opportunities. Mm. And so, and so thankfully I've had, I've had success doing that on a personal level. And as I've thought about that, I say, well, if you're going to have a lean legal team, you know, we're not going to be a huge team with hundreds of lawyers and each person in their specialty, sort of the way a big law firm is when you're on the legal side, it's, you know, how do I have a team of really talented, multi-dimensional people who also, they understand the pockets of our business and can contribute in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, and I think, I think one of the reasons why we're talking about this is because a legal team, like any other business group, um, should be thinking, in my opinion, should be thinking about, well, if that's what I want to be, where I'm going to be multidimensional and I can help in multiple ways, how do I get the biggest bang for my buck? Mm. And right, that involves, well, but let's, let's start gathering data about what it is that we do, what it is that we do well, what it is that we can improve upon. And then that will guide us into what decisions about how do I allocate my, allocate my resources, you know? The first step of managing outside counsel is, do I even need them? Can I yes. do it in Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a really good point. And I really like your point on, like, when I look at a legal team, there's a kind of a bridge to the, to the law firm, and then there's a bridge to the business, right? And both um, bridges are very important. And it's so important that you communicate really effectively with the business, because that's what's driving your instruction. And then that communication flows to the external counsel so it's interesting that link between the two and um, when you stood into the to the team like obviously that question of what do we do well and what do we maybe not do so well how did you evaluate that in, in practical terms like how did you go about kind of making that assessment you know a lot of it was just honestly it was just personal experience um so you know w whereas i'd start day one and my portfolio involves litigation so i you know, sort of learn, learn observationally what was working and what wasn't. And then it became, hey, well, you could start working in this area with our HR team, or you could start working on our commercial contracts, or you can start working on our real estate taxes. And as you as you get into each area, mm -hmm. I think observationally, that's a lot of where you start. Um, and that's part of the hard part of, you know, there's really no quick way, there's really no quick shortcut to, to understanding what's working well and what's not. You really need to roll up your sleeves, you know, and get in on the ground floor and say, what is working? What's not working? Uh, yeah. Sometimes it takes, you know, I had days where I was just completely overwhelmed to the point, well, I can't get to all this work. So how do I do this better so this doesn't happen again? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you have to get your hands dirty, I suppose? <laughs> right, exactly. And that's why, and, and that's why I, I, I thought a lot about, you know, to go back to my point about, legal team sort of being able embedded in the business and anticipating what the business people will need. It requires, you know, some creativity, some, some free flow thinking, that sort of thing, but it can't come at the expense of the daily business needs. And so in order to be able to do that, you have to have a strong foundation of, well, if I take an hour or two to work, to think about a new project, will that business, will that service contract still get looked at? You know, will that court appearance still get taken care of? Will that filing still be made? You know, those things need to be handled, need to be handled. And that's where, you know, some of the automation and tools that we'll talk about, you know, I think yeah. comes in and helps. Absolutely. And one thing that you touched on that all of my clients speak to is making the decision as to whether or not you need outside counsel in the first place. Um, I, that's just something that really interests me when I start working with new clients. For your team, like, how did you go about assessing, you know, what, what do we evaluate here in terms of making that call? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a mix. There are some there are some areas of the law that are, um, you know, a little more esoteric, not really as widely known, and so you really want to have an expert in that area. Um, mm -hmm. Some of it is, you know, based on any given one time. What do we have internally? This, you know, the the skill and the expertise that we have internally, um, so that can we even cover it? 
Um, you know, listen, the legal team is like any other team. There's turnover and at different sure. times you'll have slots that might be, might be open. And so do I even have the, the person there who can help me fill it? Some of it also is just, you know, workload. Like, you know, like I mentioned before, um, if we, if we are working on a big project, something I'd ordinarily like to handle internally, I may not even have the bandwidth and it can't wait. Um, so it's not a it's not a one size fits all. I think that's part of what thinking about your legal team at thirty thousand feet is. What are all the different practice areas that I touch, um, and how do I how do I think about each one of them? Which one is more commoditized versus which one is more specialized? Um, and there's a spectrum, and 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 that's I think where you start. Yeah, yeah, and as you say, that does take time to assess, and you know, so you've kind of you've articulated that you want to, you know, you want to have a lean team that's very much so embedded and understands the business needs and can anticipate their needs. Um, and I guess direct them in the best way forward. So my final piece on this is, you know, there's lots of different things that you're weighing up and you need to experience it to make an evaluate, uh, an informed decision. And um, what tools, if any, when you started this process, did you use uh, to help kind of assess the workload or, um assess the expertise required if any <laughs> i'm not sure right so this is one where i wish i had more i wish i had more tools early on um we weren't really using many sort of tools so to speak they were a lot of old school of you know one-on-one -on -one meetings with with your direct reports to go over what are they working on you know who's getting requests for what type of work um you know, I was very popular in that regard, so I already had sort of a leg up on, all right, I know these five people, they always ask for this, and these 10 people always prefer that. Um, yeah. We actually um, are one of what I think is sort of a rare department that actually did keep our time. Um, so we did have some we did have some time reports to say, okay, th you know, this person spends the bulk of his or her time in these three or four areas, though that was, we could talk about that separately, that wasn't without its own challenges. I can um, imagine. And so some of and so some of our thinking about how do we think about the group at thirty thousand feet is also how do we manage and keep an eye on what the workflow is better than we do it today, right? How do we know what's in people's queue? How long it's been there? How do we allocate it as efficiently as possible? Um, which I think is another another opportunity to inc introduce some tools to make to make um, you know the team more efficient. Yeah, absolutely, and. To your point about understanding the business needs, I think factoring in what what you see coming down the line for the business is a big part of right. that as well. Yeah, right. that's exactly. I've, I've had one client describe it as almost like, you know, there's boulders that you can anticipate and you need to make the call as early as possible as to how you're going to, to manage them. Okay, well, look, that's, that's really good insight. And, you know, in the five years, I guess this is, you know, do you feel like you've progressed a lot in terms, like towards that, vision of of being a lean and agile team oh i think well we're definitely a lean and agile team um i would say you know i i like to joke that you know being a lawyer at a real estate company i work at the intersection of the two industries that are the slowest to change <laughs> um, so so in my you know for in my own personal preference you know i think that there is still more opportunity to introduce new tools and introduce new ways of tracking and allocating and measuring and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but I do think, you know, I think the team is it, uh, on the whole is, is certainly lean and agile and, you know, yeah. and, and, and handles it well. Absolutely. And I would say from my own experience with your team, you know, used to technology on you know, technology, legal technology is still relatively new, but your team actually had been using legal technology for, for some time, right. uh, which is a positive. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for that. We'll move on to the next section now. So I'm going to drop down a bit. Um, so we've kind of established the team that we want, the legal team that you want to, to build out. Then there's, of course, the challenge of refining the current processes and clearing paths. And the reason why I say that's a challenge for any team, you know, you just keep on doing what it is you do day in, day out. So standing back and making changes can be hard. Um, and I'm just interested very much so to, to learn how you helped to implement these refined processes and, and clear the paths to make sure that you've teed up the most efficient legal team possible, which then will obviously have a, a positive impact on how they engage with outside counsel. 
Yeah. Yeah. So um, for me, it was, it was, you know, addressing immediate pain points, you know? <laughs> um, so the, the two of them and, and how I came to be working with Blight, Bright Flag, number one on the list was how are we handling our invoices from outside firms and measuring our spend and those sorts of things. Um, and as you mentioned, we were using, actually we were using two vendors, um, which in some ways made us ahead of the curve and in other ways um, made it a lot more cumbersome. And uh, it was a pain point because we would, we would get stuck in these back and forths about compliance with billing guidelines and is this approved, then is that approved, then is this approved? And it would drag out the approvals to go through the first vendor and then it would get to the second vendor. And before you know it, my queue of invoices goes from zero to 150 and everybody <laughs> wants to get paid and they're wondering why they haven't gotten paid in months. And I'm like, what? You, I'm like, did I do something wrong? I just got all these invoices, what's going on? But I feel bad because, you know, these these vendors are working hard for us and are doing a good job and they deserve to get paid. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and so, you know, I think we owe it to them certainly as a courtesy and as a partner to make sure that they get paid timely. Um, so that was an immediate pain point. Um, okay. And, um, you know, the other, one of the other immediate pain points I had um, was the, was just the volume and the flow of commercial contracts, day-to-day -day okay. commercial contracts. Um, you know, how do we, how, and then it became, how do we intake them? How do we allocate who's looking at them? How do we know which one's higher priority and lower priority? How do we turn it? Um, those were some immediate pain points. Um, and then, sort of that got me on the on the road to exploring hey check out this cool vendor bright flag hey check out this other vendor that does clm and as yeah. you you learn more about this legal operations field you see what's possible then you say hey i could apply that to this process and i could apply that to that process and you know the, the creative juices start flowing of course and i think as the slides says you're identifying what's draining the energy Certainly being chased for invoices is something that you don't want your lawyers spending time on. It's non-value add. So yeah, uh, devising a process to to help cure that is is something that um, should flow relatively easily. Um, I guess in terms of how you actually implement it, right? Um, how did that how did that process go for you? So I'm conscious, obviously I work with teams all the time and change technology it can be um, difficult, you know, if, if it's not done correctly, it can be difficult to roll out. How did you um, go about rolling out that change? Um, what were the messages that you used? Yeah, so so some, it depends partly on, you know, which which process or which tool. Um, <laughs> you know, I think in terms, of, in terms of Bright Flag, the messaging was pretty easy because, you know, I came in to, and, and saw more of the billing process and said, wow, this really, I'm getting, I'm getting complaints from internal people and external people. Like I couldn't find one person to tell me they liked how the, how that process was going. And so wh when you go through the demos and you start visualizing, okay, this is how we're going to improve. When you communicate that to the firms or to the stakeholders say, Hey, I know this is a pain point for you. I'm going to make it better. You know, so just to use one example, we have, um, a t three different firms in one area of practice and they, they handle, uh, you know, c commercial transactions for us. And, um, and the billing process was such that they would have to submit the bills through the old two vendor tiered process. And yet at the same time, prepare manual reports to go to another group in the company. So you have these two separate processes for them. That was a tremendous time suck. And that didn't include billable time for them. And so one of the, to them, the communication was easy. It was, hey, I found this tool that I'm going to eliminate that work for you. And I'm going to make it easier so that you can submit your bills in PDF instead of a leads file. You, mm -hmm. don't, have to, you don't have to prepare that second report. I'm going to be able to get to it quicker and you're going to be happy. You know, and they were, you know, they were very happy to hear all those things. Yeah, yeah, that's true. When you put it like that, when you can take those types of things off the table for people, right. Um, right. it does make managing that change much easier. And right. to the point of outside counsel, when they've got better visibility in a more streamlined process, it's going to have a knock-on positive impact on the, on the relationship. Yeah. So that totally makes sense for sure. And just now that you're reflecting, I mean, you've implemented Bright Flag and I'm sure other systems as well. Um, you know, what 
what's been your biggest learning um, in that context in terms of refining the processes, implementing onboarding? What, what has been the biggest takeaway for you in that? Um, you can't overemphasize just the need to communicate and to you know, be a little patient with people. You know, I like to, I like to joke, um, and I feel like as a lawyer, I'm allowed to make this joke, but I, I joke that, you know, like lawyers are notoriously bad with technology. And so when you talk to lawyers about, hey, you know, I'm going to use this AI thing and I'm going to use this, they think you're from outer space, even though then they take their iPhone out of their pocket and start, you know, using AI. There's yeah. like this disconnect going on. Yeah. And so, yeah. But, you know, smart people, capable, smart people, it's just something new to them. And like a lot of other things, it requires, you know, a little bit of patience, communication, training, you know, helping out, you know, some, some firms picked up things quicker than others. Um, and so you just have to be prepared for that and just help manage it. It's not going to be perfect day one, you know, but you yeah. can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Of course. No, particularly when you're automating those, it's, uh, even for your inside, your internal team as well, like eliminating some of those things helps right. that process and helps that. Yeah. Like see the, the overall vision of it okay well that's interesting thank you um we've kind of spoke a lot about you know okay assessing the internal team um what will help them uh, be more efficient and effective what helps them to you know the classic thing that i hear every time we start to onboard a client is i don't want my people spending too much time on invoice review it's not what they want to do in their day-to-day -day role um, so kind of taking those admin tasks off as much as possible is an important assessment of kind of refining the processes. Um, but it's been very internally focused. So just in terms of the next area, which is where we talk about setting expectations and also handling exceptions, I think this is where, you know, the outside counsel link comes in, uh, comes into play very much so. Right. So, yeah, like, I mean, you've obviously had experience um, you know, in terms of uh, bringing in a new piece of technology, um, what would you say, like, from your perspective and your experience, how did you ensure that the new expectations of your outside counsel were understood, first of all, within the legal team, and then secondly, with your outside counsel? Because I, I, I think of it in two different layers almost, but success in communicating both of them is essential for success of the, the process, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I don't think I can emphasize enough the importance of communication. And when I mean communication, I really do mean a two way street, you know. So I knew, I understood what the firm's pain points were because I asked them, you know, I'd call the, the relationship attorney, the partner, and I'd say, you know, I, I'm looking at this process. I'm looking at how we do this. What do you see? How does this help? Does this help you or is it painful for you, too? Is there something <laughs> I can do to make your life better? You know, it's not. It's not a one-way relationship, and I say, and same thing for the for the internal staff. You know, everybody sees things on the team a little bit different than others. People have different internal business clients they interact with. They have different work they perform. They have different needs to get back from from the processes that we have. And so, when you get people's perspective on it, you know, you sort of lay it on the table early on. Hey, I I really think that this could be something that we can improve on. What do you see? Am I crazy? Am I crazy? Or am I onto something? If I am, I'm thinking of, you know, how about ABC? Do you think that makes sense? Do you think I'm missing any details? Um, and I think when you get, when you, when you include people like that, um, they buy in, you know, they're invested in it um, and they contribute to it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it really goes towards the success of a partnership. Um, when you do that, when you have a two-way communication. Okay. That's, that's interesting. And in terms of then with the outside council itself so you've got this new tool in place so let's say bright flag um and you're obviously deriving certain insights from it and possibly um finding certain um you know things that you wouldn't expect to see um like i know we talked before like budgeting is super important um and we all appreciate that sometimes things can spiral particularly litigations it's hard to call but barring typically barring something crazy you know you expect to commit at a certain point how do you deal with those situations because you know I, i'm intrigued as to your approach because everyone has a slightly different approach in terms of managing outside counsel in that regard yeah i mean i think you know in the example that we talked about before 
you know, sometimes the companies are at a disadvantage um, because some types of work might be one-offs for us, but for the firms, it's what they do routinely. So mm-hmm. when a firm when a firm says, "Hey, I really think that this work should cost a hundred thousand dollars," and and your opinion is, "Well, you know, I really only expected to spend about thirty thousand." Um, when the when the partner says, "In good faith, hey, okay, I do this regularly, and I typically charge a hundred thousand uh, dollars," mm-hmm. we're sort of at a disadvantage a little bit. Now we have, you know, we often have people who've sort of sat in that chair, and so they have some baseline for it. Um, mm-hmm. But we don't have the as rich of data and experience as the firms do, um, and um, so some of that is is the give and take. And this is the part that drew me the most to Bright Flag, which, as as early users of Bright Flag, ESRT is only starting to scratch the surface. It, it's the benchmarking aspect of it. It's what are my peers doing, or what are other companies doing? You know, sort of level the playing field a little bit. Um, well. Is that really true? Does it really cost a hundred thousand dollars to do this kind of work? Mm-hmm. And um, you know, the best way to deal with that uh, is to surface it up front, right? Is to budget by matter up front. Yeah. Um, and so, if, if you say, okay, this is the work I'm going to do, how much do you think it's going to cost? Well, I think it's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars. Really? Well, what's going to make it cost so much? Maybe that mm-hmm. gives you a way to either streamline the 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 project or um, streamline you know think about different ways to get to the point that makes everybody comfortable and everybody happy um, and so i think i think that's something that that i think we're going to see continue continue to build on uh, mm-hmm. you know and get better at to avoid the uncomfortable discussions of now you've got will what am i going to do with it yeah yeah that's so true like what i've heard time and time again is you want to move away from dealing with the situation after it's kind of blown up Right. Um, and how you do that, what I've seen work well is instead of this kind of back of the envelope pricing, um, which we've all seen come out, um, it is drilling down and being a little bit more prescriptive about, OK, well, let's break this out into phases, this particular piece of work. And what's the like I've seen clients move from back of the paper to actually having a proactive conversation where they're like, well, what's the resourcing level for this particular part of the matter? What, who, who are you going to use as staffing? And then, of course, you can check it, right? Because you've got everybody approved as a timekeeper. You can start to see that, that data on the other side. But proactively managing it is good for you and also good for the law firm. So right. it's much easier to, to avoid problems if you do it that way. Um, I guess, like, I always think about it as well. Like, there's obviously technology. It's very important to have all these data insights. But there's the people aspect of it too. Um, in your experience, um, did you have any challenging conversations with your law firms when you, you know, kind of were explaining this? I know you obviously were able to take a lot of the manual um, work off them, which is great. But because you were starting to hone in on that more kind of prescriptive analysis of what they actually do, how 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 was that? Like, how did that conversation go? Yeah, you? I mean, they're not they're not easy conversations to have. Um, you know, they're they're uncomfortable. Um, and I think, you know, you just have to keep in mind, um, these are your partners, you know, Mm -hmm. they're not, not, you know, sort of a mercenary service provider kind of person that you can just cut off and move on to the next person is there are partners and we want to, we want to work with them and we hope they feel the same way about us. And so Mm -hmm. we don't want, you know, if to use my example, if I got a bill for a hundred thousand dollars for a matter that in my opinion should have cost 30. If I am able to negotiate him down to 30, did I do a good job? Well, I guess on the one hand, I saved $70,000. But on the other hand, I might have made the partner look bad when he goes back to the, his people internally. And he's like, well, you have to write off $70,000 worth of time. What happened here? That's yeah, that's, a way to build a good relationship. No, you're so right. And it's a relationship that's so premised on trust and, you know, kind of, yeah, like it's such an important strategic relationship that you don't want to go down that road. And I think to say it again, being proactive so at the start of that conversation saying okay well I think we should come in at about 30 and there's that conversation and you can use data to justify it you're avoiding that awkward encounter where there's a, a significant haircut and um, yeah and I do think as well you're right in that communication is is key and um, and you you want good partners or partnerships like so it has to be benefiting both sides and um, that's what I've learned from my experience 
Right. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for that. That's really that's really interesting. And just what we're going to move to next then is the final piece. And I know that this is a little bit. I know you're new at Bright Flag, um, but so so part of this will be visionary. But how you evaluate performance without bias, and you know, an anecdote that I have heard many people speak to, and we spoke to it is how do you move away from kind of selecting a firm based on oh I went to college with that person or I was in house there or I worked or trained there before I moved here. How do you kind of start to evaluate performance of outside counsel without bias and with objective data? And I guess, you know, what's the, what have you experienced as the most effective way to do that? And, and what's your vision in terms of using the data longer term? Yeah, well, I think in, in the spirit of continuing with the theme that it starts up front, you know, I think one thing that the legal world could use more of that we don't have enough of right now is, uh, you know, an RFP type process. And it, might, and it might lend itself to some types of work more than others. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's frequently and now in the day and age where there's always alternative fee arrangements and capped fees and all these different types of things. When you ask a lawyer that one-on-one, -on -one, hey, do you, do you do any discounts? Do you do any capped fees? Oftentimes they like to say, well, well, I can't really, I can't really estimate that. I can't really cap the fee. It's too difficult, mm. you know? Um, and they probably get away with that a lot yeah. um, versus if you were to send out an RFP and say, just so you know, I'm, I'm asking four or five firms to bid this, not because I'm trying to, um, you know, take away work from you or I'm trying to change the relationship, but I do as a fiduciary have an obligation to my firm to say, am I, am I fully educated about what is market in this area? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I keep thinking of the example, you know, Empire State's a, Empire State Realty Trust is a real estate company. Um, and does a lot of construction projects. And, you know, imagine if the, the general contractor said, hey, you know, I'd really love to hire this contractor because he's my cousin's friend. Well, did you get bid? Did you, did you ask them what, what it's going to cost to demo and yeah. to, to white box and all these things? No, 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 but I know him. He's a good guy. He's my cousin's friend. Like that doesn't, that doesn't fly. You bid it out, you level the bids, and you see where you're going to get the best bang for your buck. Doesn't mean you always have to pick the cheapest one. Uh, no. Sometimes this one is cheap because it's not going to be good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but you at least now are armed with the 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 starting point of, all right, here's the spectrum of what I can expect. And mm -hmm. if I'm willing to pay the extra for it, un understand why going in. You know, I'm willing to pay extra because this person really has an expertise or because this person's been in front of that judge, you know, more than anybody else. And I think he'll get a good outcome. Or, yeah. you know, this guy's, this guy's dealt with the um, this particular regulator at the SEC. You know, whatever it is, at least you have an understanding of what it is you're actually paying for. Mm, absolutely. And as you say, you're setting the expectation very early what, right. what it is that you want. Um, right. Yeah. And I guess you're you're setting that clear kind of objective framework for evaluation. Right. So you've done that. Um, and in terms of like your outside counsel will obviously understand that because you've had a conversation up front um, your criteria is clear. It's consistent and fair, as we say here. So then in practical terms, um, you know, fast forward, they've done the piece of work. Um, how are you evaluating? Like what, what is your vision in terms of how you benchmark and evaluate firms? Well, some of it is, I think, um, you know, how are we doing against our budget? You know, let's just start there. Like we thought that this motion would cost us fifty thousand dollars. Did it cost fifty thousand? Did it cost more? Um, and if it did, why? Um, and sometimes there, are, a lot of times, there are good explanations. You know, in a litigation, for example, you can have a really, really stubborn adversary. That yeah. happens. So it's going to cost you more money. Um, yeah. You know, I think that that's a place to start. I think again, the vision for the future is not just not just how did I do against my budget? How did I do against other people who've been in similar situations? Mm. No. Um, and I, I think about that more, you know, litigations are, you know, a little more sui generis. So it might be harder, but, you know, some transactional type work yeah. where, you know, firms are comfortable doing them on fixed fees or, or some hybrid arrangement. Um, you know, is that the best way to do it? Or that, is that the way other companies in this space do it? What's their experience been? Uh, maybe there's room for improvement. Um, you know, that's how, and then some of this, I, I agree with um, how we phrase the goal of we want to be clear and have objective criteria. Some of this does come down. There is a little bit of the subjective element, which is 
do I think the work product is good? You know, uh. reading the draft motion papers, do I think they're well written? Do I think that they argue our position as best as they can? You know, if I'm reviewing an agreement, do I think the agreement is well drafted? Does it think about all the points that and the permutations that need to be addressed or were there holes in it? Well, some of that is qualitative, um, but you have to have a, a systematic, efficient way to capture that qualitative data too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's a, it's a blend of the quantitative and qualitative, right? right, right. Um, yeah, that's what we've learned. And we've actually productized that um, to help our clients get that global view of a law firm um and budgeting it's interesting like it's definitely one of the main the, like the first um and most impactful ways to evaluate the law firm if they're not coming in where they say they are then that is a challenge and it's it's going to blow your budget so it's not a good thing and um, just i and this is probably a more future focused question but see you know you talk to managing outside counsel in the context of budgeting in the context of probably billing guideline compliance you know because you've set these expectations where are they coming in on them and um, what other areas you know would you longer term like to start evaluating outside counsel on um certainly um you know as esrt as a public company um and i guess all companies but certainly public companies are sensitive to um you know diversity and and uh, equity and inclus inclusion efforts um and you know that's something that i think companies have been enforcing rightfully so and i think we'll continue to enforce of does the firm's mission or you know does the firm's culture and mission align with ours so you know we are you know we're trying very hard to promote de and i is the firm doing the same thing or is every or is every matter that i'm getting staffed with people who fit the same profile and they're not even thinking about diversity at all you know and that was one of the things i mentioned to sinead and, and others at bright flag which um the the functionality that you're working on to sort of help track that um, yeah. not just that the hey you know we're such a large law firm we have you know x number of people who fit this demographic it's no no, no like and are they on the account are they are they billing are they working are you giving yeah. them to do um so i think that's going to be that is you know that is and will continue to be another area where um you you we're gonna hope that you know the firms are aligned with what we're trying to accomplish sure. absolutely and it's something that was very much so a focus for a lot of our clients which is why we we again built out some of that functionality but when we stand back and think about it it is incredible to think that like 10 years ago talking about these types of criteria and how you'd measure them against a law firm they're just the the you know the tools i guess weren't really there to help and there probably wasn't as much of a desire to have these types of conversations. There has been like a really radical change. Um, even I see it in the five years working at Bright Flag, you know, to think that we're talking about diversity inclusion and that you can see a graph of like, you know, all of these different things, who's build time, you know, which is so important. Um, to think that we're now evaluating law firms on that kind of level is amazing. It's, it's great. And there's been a lot of change in the industry. Um, so, you know, one of the takeaways for me in discussing this with you just now and also in prepping is, um, you know, the law firm legal team partnership is so important um, and technology is only going to get better and improve. So it's so important that law firms understand your expectations. I, I think that's something that I really feel it comes off every conversation I have with clients. You have to communicate to them because this has been such a fundamental change and an important one. Yeah. But communication is key. I agree. Communication is key. And I think you can even take it a step further. I mean, not in the in the COVID world, it's hard um, to do what I'm about to suggest. But um, in the non COVID world, um, mm. where you're having social interactions with the firms, right, the partner wants to take you to lunch, or they have a yeah. Christmas party, or they have a, you know, we as a client have an opportunity to um, insist on and include younger associates, you know, uh, lawyers with diverse backgrounds who we want to who we want to give the opportunities to you know mm -hmm. the opportunity to get to know a client is a is a, is a big thing yeah, um, yeah. You know, and, it, and it can be as simple as you know a short social conversation uh, at a Christmas party or yeah. you know, when you go out to lunch or you have drinks after a big case uh, yeah. yeah so it's a good yeah. observation actually yeah it's like it's just changing the the approach because typically that would be partner led and you know you might never get to see the person who's done right. a lot of the work on the file yeah 
Right. Um, and building that relationship is so important. Um, right. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Well, like, I mean, I think to kind of to summarize the different themes that we've talked to, um, you know, I think that certainly at an overall level, communication is very important um, and being upfront with your firms about your expectations. Um, the, the first few steps that we talked about, so kind of deciding who you want to be um, clearing and clearing and refining processes to ensure that you can do that. Um, they're very important and they're very much so internal focused. So any final tips, Jonathan, on how you get the internal in-house store in order? Um, just a kind of a takeaway point on that. Yeah, you know, I, I was reading I was reading a, a business consulting um, advice book for a project I was I was doing a few months back. And it was funny because the, the author's advice was at the same time, you have to be stubborn and you have to be flexible. And you're like, well, how do you do that? Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's probably art, more, more art than science. Yes. Uh, but to me, the, the legal operations field is a really exciting place to be. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of great ideas out there and it's only the beginning. And yeah. so you have to find that right balance between how do you make sure you're stubborn because you know this idea is good and it's going to work and it's going to be a massive improvement while at the same time not being so stubborn that you alienate all your stakeholders. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a delicate balance, but if you can strike balance. it, it's, it brings great um, returns. And then on the final two, which were more kind of mixed legal team and law firm, setting expectations and evaluating the performance. I think the key message for me from you is over communicate <laughs> and yeah. be clear on the expectations. Anything else? Any other tips for? No, I think that's, I think that's the, the big one. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, again, leaving room, you know, to go back to this balance of being stubborn about what you expect, but also being flexible if, if you know, for, for justified exceptions. Yes, yes. So again, yeah, it's kind of to that point you talked about, yeah, like the, the balance between the two. Um, yeah, that's that's really good. And I think in the context of what I've seen is in the context of evaluating performance, even just start small, but start with something that's consistent and applicable um, and that you, you communicate to your firms, but then you hold through on it and you like have a quarterly meeting and you actually bring the data in. I think that's a really important thing. It's terrible to go through this effort of rolling something out and then not consistently stick with the evaluation piece. So that's just my observation on that side. Um, well, thank you very much. I think we can probably open it to some questions. Um, so I see Reen. Um, uh, Reen has asked, are you finding that you can internalize more legal functions as you utilize technology and data insights? And if so, what functions are low hanging fruit? Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely the hope. I mean, I think some of the things we were working on were were earlier in our journey. Um, you know, so bringing in bright flag and freeing up time from you know administrative tasks um, allowed us to bring more functions in house. I mean, I think I think the technology will help us bring more commoditized work in house. You know, so the better you get at contract review, the more contracts you you can review you know, quicker, yeah. uh, the more, the better you get at, um, at draft, you know, automatically drafting routine correspondence and these sorts of things, the more of that you can do, or the, that leaves more time to address some of the more sweet, generous issues. If I don't have to spend an hour or two on this more routine matter, I have an hour or two I can do on this unique issue that we haven't seen before. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's freeing up the time to really get stuck into the the the, the more substantive or more value add pieces. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting what you say as well. Like what I've seen too is this almost three tiered approach. So, um, I've seen a lot of clients kind of they used to just traditionally outsource to the firms that they had relationships with, but particularly for like rinse and repeat, lease renewals, that type of thing, they're now uh, factoring it out to alternative service providers who are doing it at a much cheaper rate um and you know like that there's lots of different things that you can lots of different angles you can take i think just standing back and thinking about it and assessing the lay of the land is is a is an important first step in that um yeah so there is plenty of low-hanging fruit opportunity there um that's 
hopefully that's answered your question, Rain. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions. Guys, I, I think you did such a great job, uh, Shalene. It's just been fantastic. It just, I've been on the edge of my seat just listening to, to everything uh, plugged in. Jonathan, you're a breath of fresh air, man. Just for yes. somebody, somebody, well, somebody who's like elevated an attorney working on massive matters to be so tuned into technology and, and, and sharing that information with passion. I love it. I yeah, I'll, 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 I, at least I got one person today on their edge of their seat. After this, I'm going back to help with, you know, my young daughters, and they don't find this nearly as interesting. So it was a breath of fresh air for, for me to talk to you guys as well. Yeah, sure. well, I can say having worked with Jonathan, he's a brilliant, like, innovative um, lawyer and really is very forward thinking. So it was an absolute pleasure to to roll out bright flag with you and, and learn from you in that process and also to get to tap into more of your experience on this so thank you very much jonathan for that thank you for saying that i i feel the same way about sinead and the bright flag team for sure <laughs> awesome awesome Sinead. just one more question before you go you you've, you've asked all the great questions so i don't think there's any more left for me but <laughs> but jonathan jonathan had mentioned uh he had mentioned the uh, rfps and diversity like the the you when you're when you're doing RFPs, if you haven't did them or if you're even thinking about them, would you look at your existing panel and would you actually go deeper than the attorneys that you've used to say see if there's anybody else that that have better win rates within? Let's say you go with Cooley or somebody like Leda Watkins, and you say, "Wow, I'm using X who doesn't have a particular win rate." Would that would that would that make you kind of pause for a second and say, "Hey, I may I may use the same firm." You know, but I'll use somebody else if if the data points and analytics are there. Yeah, I think I think you have to always let the data tell you the story. It doesn't have to tell you how to handle it, but you have to at least be honest and objective about what the story is. Um, you know, so in your in your hypothetical, if I saw data where you know uh, diverse attorneys were having a better win rate, I would for sure think in my head, okay, how do I get those people integrated? Now that part is. You know that's where the the interpersonal part comes in, and maybe you do it over time, and you don't do it all at once. And you know, if you give the firm a little bit of work, you do it where you try to find a way to sort of make it a win-win for people. So you don't. I, I never like to be in the situation unless I absolutely have to, where people feel like I've taken work away from them or I've put them in a bad spot. Um, I want to give people sort of a win-win. So it's hard to generalize how to negotiate that, uh, but you have to be open to what the data tells you. You can't. You can't just ignore it and say, well, I've worked with this guy forever, so I don't really care what the data says. Yeah, and that goes back to your 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 talk on the relationship part of it, where it's like you, you got to manage the relationship and then look at the data points. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a delicate balance, isn't it? It is. A, it is a delicate balance. But you can, you know, like like in anything else, if you're if you are transparent about it and you're and you communicate about it, um, you give the firm an opportunity to, to come up with a way to address it, you know. In a way that yeah. makes them happy too. Yeah, exactly. They win in the end when you're both right. on the same wavelength. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm. Right. So, so I, I know Bright Flag is, is is doing like a heavy lift with the you know initiatives, but I'd like to mm. hear from Jonathan's perspective how he utilized that you know data to to reach out to firms and uh, you know how, how are you thinking about this? Are you using ABA surveys? To get some of this information, where are you getting your data points from when you're when you're evaluating firms based on these DEI initiatives? So this for us is more right now more aspirational than practical. Um, you know, I mean, this is something that we're more. It's still, I'd say, sort of old school type of approach, um, and some somewhere where I think a lot of companies have room to grow. Um, you know, so for us, it's you know just anecdotally understanding, all right, what firms do we work with and who are the partners and the associates on our matters? And do we feel, you know, uh, qualitatively or subjectively, do we feel like we're doing enough? Um, and where are the opportunities that we could do better? You know, or once we, I was once, our group was once just discussing this topic generally, and we started with the threshold question, um, do we fully recognize the, how well some of our firms are doing in this regard, you know, like to, to use an example that's top of mind. I mean, we, we do one area of work, fair amount of work with a firm, a boutique firm. Um, and we know that the main attorney we work with is, is female. Um, but sometimes you get lost in your day to day and you don't take a step back and say, Hey, wait a second. 
I didn't realize that this firm, you know, is 100% women owned and it and has a special certification in the real estate world. Like, I'm really glad about that. I just wish I made that known to more people. You know, yeah, so it is, some of it yeah. is, what, what are you already doing that you don't even know about? Yeah, <laughs> it's just trying to surface it off, right? Right, it's surface actually, it up. right. Yeah, yeah. We, so, we use the ABA standard, um, Colin, in terms of the questions that we've built out. It's a new, relatively new feature, um, but it is based on the ABA standard. And it's surfacing out, it out and it, the data will tell you a story is the idea behind it so that you can quickly see those things. And sorry, I should have said this too. You know, we talk about billing guidelines, budget adherence, and sometimes there's almost like a negative spin on it. But it's so important for good outside council relationships to also reward the really good work that law firms do for, for legal teams as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's an important part of the relationship. Well, I just want to say this has been fascinating. I really, really appreciate the both of you. This is uh, the feedback I'm getting in my text. Just amazing. And um, oh. I, I would say, I would say to the attendees, please give us some feedback that we like the good, the bad, the ugly, give it to us. Give us the feedback in the comments um, afterwards, and we will be following up with a copy of the recording. And if guys, I, I want to see, can they reach out to you if you have any other questions? Of course, sure. yeah, that's no problem. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can circulate my email with you, Colin, after and. And um, yeah, absolutely keen to speak to anybody who has extra questions. I like this topic, it's interesting. So uh, keen to learn from others. <clears throat> Brilliant. Th thank you so much for your time today, guys. I uh, really appreciate it and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks, thank Colin. You. Thank you, Jonathan. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Brilliant stuff, guys. Bye bye.